Okay, thank you very much. My name is James Gilling. I manage the uh, Australian Aid Program here in Indonesia, and it's a great pleasure to be here introducing such a great panel. How, how asked me before to be the uh, traffic cop to make sure this runs on time? I think it suggests that Howard has been away from uh, Jakarta too long if you think that traffic cops make things run on time. But nonetheless, um, this is going to be a, a, an hour or so session. I've asked the uh, presenters, if you would, to keep uh, strictly to 15 minutes, and I shall be uh, fairly ruthless around that, so, um, or accepting uh, small considerations. So, how would you like to start? Um, I believe you'll be doing your presentation right now. Thanks. Thank you very much to CSIS and the Indonesia Project for organising this event, uh, especially organising an event in honour of our dear late friend, Hadi Sassastro. Uh, I gave, had the honour of giving the first Hadi Sassastro lecture last year and it's very good to be back here a second time now. So for this, this is a session on the, uh, the update of the update. So as you, I think you will know in Canberra we've had an Indonesia update uh, continuously since 1983 uh, and each year we have a general survey of the economy and the politics and then we pick a theme for more detailed examination. The theme for last year uh, was this one, regional dynamics in a decentralised Indonesia. Uh, we had a lot of interesting presentations and the the book which came out of it has just been launched by Nikli uh, Bahadi Basri. And so the purpose of this uh, session with the, with the four of us is to give you a little bit of a, a picture of some of the key messages in the book. Uh, it's unfortunately Waktunya Turbata Sakali Hanisaku Jam, so we don't really have time to include all the speakers. In fact, the book has Jumla uh, Perulis Papapulutiga. There's a lot of, lot, of, um, a lot of authors in the book, uh, and I'm very pleased to say that a lot of the authors uh, of the book chapters are in the audience today. In fact, I've counted, I think we have 11 of the 43 speakers who are represented here today. I, I, I really apologise that not all of the speakers can present because of the time constraint, but I think we'll have time for uh, Q&A. Uh, James Gillian, I need to hit the traffic cop if we you will allow us to have a little bit of Q&A, so Jimmy has to come. Now let me also just say thank you very much to, to uh, DFA Aid for, for supporting this endeavour, this uh, Indonesia project and also the update. And thank you again to the contributors to the volume, the book volume, uh, and a special thanks to the editor, Beth, Beth Thompson, who did a wonderful job. Okay, uh, so... Uh, I want to just briefly introduce some of the key questions in the uh, in, in the book, uh, and you will see from the you will see from the book if you've already got a copy of the book you will see the contents. Uh, and so of these of these speakers uh, of the contributors, several are here today. Uh, Anne Wilb is here, uh, Michael Spencer is here. We'll talk later on. Uh, Matthew Wakeboy is here as well. Uh, with a couple of guys. No. Uh, and uh, Blaine Lewis. Uh, uh, Bambang Koko is here somewhere. He's also one of the contributors. Uh, Neil McCulley is here. The, the, the ever present Neil McCulley is here somewhere. Thank you, Neil. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have a good representation. Uh, in the next group of papers, uh, uh, you've done one of the speakers, uh, 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 and uh, Laura Vijaya, I think, might be here as well. Uh, uh, and then the next group of speakers, we have uh, both Chris Nanny and uh, uh, Wawan, uh, uh, represented here. Uh, and in the final group of speakers, we have um, my boss, Woody Verso Sudan, uh, is here. So we have quite a, quite a, a wide group of speakers. I should just mention that uh, our dear friend, another dear late friend, we dedicated the book to Yanko Romat. Uh, uh, taking out the so and he, of course he passed away in the middle of the preparation of the book so we, and many of us, he was a mentor to us and so we thought it would be appropriate to actually dedicate the book in his memory. Okay, so um, the, the context of the book, let me just mention a little bit about the motivation for, for the topic. 
uh, and it, in fact, it was mentioned by uh, Pat Lentry uh, at the beginning in his presentation uh, that uh, Indonesia not only is the world's largest archipelagic state, but during the years 1997 to 2001, it experienced tumultuous change. Uh, it had one of the deepest economic crises in recorded modern economic history, not just Indonesia, but, but in the world. Uh, it had this remarkable and successful transition from authoritarian to democratic rule, and it also had uh, what is often called a big bang decentralization. So we have to see the decentralization uh, of 2001 in the context of these broader economic and political changes which were occurring at the same time. Uh, another part of the context which, which I think is important, uh, I like using this quote by the famous Clifford Gertz, who uh, had this sentiment that Indonesia's archipelagic in geography, effective in civilization, heterogeneous in culture, it flourishes when it accepts and capitalizes on its diversity, disintegrates when it denies and suppresses. So, the way the spirit of Goethe, I guess, is embodied in a lot of the reforms of 2001. Uh, more controversial is my ANU colleague, uh, Robert Cribb, the historian, who said a glance at the map might seem enough to suggest the improbability of Indonesia. He was meaning that to say that Indonesia is a great success, in a sense, in spite of its, uh, of its geography. And, and I guess that's also been a factor in the decision to decentralize in 2001. Uh, a little bit of theory is also relevant, and in fact, uh, Pat Mentor reminded us of, of some of that theory in his presentation this morning. The principle is that fiscal federalism, that is, although Indonesia is not called a federal state, in practice it has decentralized a lot of the administrative and financial authority to the reach to the local governments. The argument is that decentralized governments uh, might be expected to produce superior uh, quality of governance, the argument being that uh, uh, local officials are more accountable to the local community uh, and you can kick them out if you don't like them. And the argument also is that, in fact, referred to by Patera in his talk was the principle is that competition amongst local governments for scarce you know, capital and labour skills uh, might actually give quality. So that, that were some of the guiding principles for the volume. Uh, let's look at some of the questions and the questions uh, uh, are many, but include the following. First of all, we wanted to know how has uh, how have Indonesia's regional development dynamics changed since 2001. In fact, uh, the argument I think in the book is surprisingly little, given how big the changes in policy have been. Secondly, uh, how closely the social outcomes, especially poverty, incidents, environmental management, correlate with these dynamics over time, and have the poorer regions been protected by the reforms? And the conclusion in the book is that, that, that the, the changes correlate quite closely. In fact, we're going to have two talks on this later. That's from, from Matt and from, from Dayu. And the poorer regions have done relatively well since 2001. I emphasize relatively well. Uh, a third question which we ask is, uh, among, the, among the many factors shaping socio-economic uh, outcomes among the regions, how important has the decentralization reform been? And that is, relative to other factors which have shaped the pattern of regional development dynamics, including in particular the provision of infrastructure and the china induced commodity boom. Uh, our conclusion is that, is that all these factors have been important, and in some ways they've been brought, the other factors have been more important than the decentralization reforms itself, so sort of narrowly defined. Uh, the fourth question is, has decentralization contributed to the strategically important goal of the preservation of the, com the country's territorial integrity, especially in the sometimes challenging peripheral regions? And, and here we give a, a, a definite yes that the reforms have been effective in that regard, even though in particular Papua has particular challenges which are discussed in the Papua chapters of the book. Uh, a fifth question is, is how have population mobility, labour market integration, migration, urbanisation been affected by these, these changes? Uh, let's discuss one of the chapters of uh, Chris Nanny and Wawan. And the conclusion is they certainly have had an impact, uh, but the counterfactual is they, a lot of these changes probably would have occurred anyway, even without it. And then a final question is how the reforms work in practice? Uh, and, and here I want to get into some of the key messages from the book in a bit more detail, uh, watching also the time. Yeah? Uh, little bit of luck again. Um, so I want to just emphasize five key points. Uh, this is uh, about Rajas and Pulu Halaman in five minutes, so very brief summary. 
But just a few quick points. And the other speakers will elaborate in a bit more detail. First key point, really important, is the reforms have worked. They've worked in the sense that Indonesia is a democratic, increasingly prosperous nation, uh, and the threat of any kind of territorial disintegration has receded. If you take the first law of government is do no harm, at least the reforms have worked in that sense, and that's a really important point. Second important point is that relations between central government and local governments have at least been operationalized. The administrative and the financial relations have been operationalized, but as several authors in the book show, the operational details don't yet really conform to the so-called textbook case. Again, Putnam remind us of this this morning. For example, the evidence on the quality of local government services suggests not a really big improvement. Uh, the second issue discussed by some of the authors is that local government spending on salaries and overheads seem to have become unhealthily large. Uh, thirdly, uh, widespread high levels of corruption, as Parliamentary said, in a sense, kakaen juga, sort of decentralised as it were. Uh, a fourth challenge is the process of the splintering or the fragmentation of boundaries of that process for Mekaran has continued unabated and, and challenges the effectiveness of the reforms. And fifthly, uh, decentralized the infrastructure issues, which in a sense are the glue which holds together local governments, uh, really have become very serious. Then the question is, are uh, the first and second of these conversions in conflict, seemingly success to puppy? And uh, the conclusion of the book is that they aren't necessarily in conflict, in the sense that electors can actually kick out uh, uh, governments they don't like. So there is that sort of democratic freedom. And of course, Indonesia is not the only country which has problems at local government level. In fact, it's a, a worldwide phenomenon. But the conclusion from the book, from the chapters, is that over time, if some of these gov local governance quality issues aren't addressed, over time, conclusion one and conclusion two could come into conflict. And so that, in a way, is the worry that um, unless the reforms, in a sense, the process of reform of the initial reforms uh, is continued, the Indonesia may face some more serious challenges in terms of local government quality and centre-region relations. Uh, so that's, that's the, 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 the next point. Uh, the third point we make from the book is to say that uh, regional development patterns have changed actually less than might have been expected given the magnitude of the reforms in 2001. First point is that almost all regions have enjoyed the post-2000 growth and poverty reductions and there's no increase in inter-regional inequality, at least at the provincial level. So that's also a kind of question mark. How deep have been the impacts of, of the reforms in terms of day-to-day -day, uh, government? Uh, and one of the reasons why we have to see these regional development reforms in context is that a lot of other factors actually influence the way the sub-national economies operate in Indonesia, as we know. Uh, it's about much more than centre-region relations. For example, regional integration requires efficient infrastructure, which is, I guess, one of the nation's biggest challenges. Increasingly, regional economies are not just nationally integrated, but they're internationally integrated, especially the parts of Western Indonesia, which are so close to Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and other countries. Uh, thirdly, it's also important that given Indonesia is such a diverse country in terms of its commodity and natural resource endowments, whenever you have a commodity boom, the impacts are always going to be very uneven. If Indonesia had several exchange rates in one country, the Kalimantan rupiah would have appreciated a lot over the past decade, and the rupiah NKT had had its own rupiah past the Akantur. So it, without that sort of exchange rate, equilibrating effects of a commodity boom, inevitably you're going to have these very uneven regional developments. Uh, another factor, as I mentioned, is that some regions do face unique, unique uh, uh, governance challenges, and particularly I think Papua comes out in the book as there are several Papua authors, and that also comes out as a particular challenge in, uh, in the book. And as I mentioned, Kamekaran is a continuing challenge. A final point just to emphasise is, is the following. If you read the literature uh, globally on the importance of cities, on the importance of cities, uh, that literature is increasingly saying that sub, the national governments are not where a lot of the action is. A lot of the action as you decentralise power and resources is moving to the sub-national level. Uh, and I think this book 
this book illustrates that in fact by looking at particular challenges in particular regions in Indonesia, you, you see that proposition being very clearly illustrated. And I'll just mention a few examples in the, which come out in the book. For example, if you think about some of the literature and economics talks about so-called binding constraints, what are the, what are the major issues which are, which are really holding back particular uh, economies, both national and local? And uh, one, for example, we have a chapter in the book by uh, Professor Tommy Firma uh, from ETB on, uh, on Jaboda Deta, ja, Jaboda Dek. I'm always calling it Jaboda Dek, the old one. Uh, and, and Tommy, of course, says that the challenge in, in, a, in a way great in greater Chicago is to do with infrastructure, it's to do with urban amenities and pollution and green space. So the sort of challenges you think about in Jakarta, you wouldn't think about necessarily in other economies. Uh, the, the Papua chapters emphasise you know, the enclave nature of development in, in Papua, the extreme, uh, the extreme inequality uh, both between uh, regions within Papua and also between ethnic groups, uh, and the isolation of the economy from the national and global economy. So different set of challenges come out in the Papua chapters. But if you're thinking of Indonesia about the sort of export-oriented industrialization centres, which are really mainly yeah, West Java, Banten, uh, East Java, and Batam. The issues become much more about connecting to the global economy, connecting to global production networks. And, and, and so then you think about infrastructure again. So the infrastructure issue arises particularly for, for those chapters. Uh, if you're thinking about the, about the resource rich regions, uh, especially Kalimantan, as we'll hear in a minute from you, uh, it's about managing fragile economies while also ensuring that you have fiscal regimes which ensure that the benefits from the, from the commodity boom actually go through the government into better local resources, into education, health facilities and so on, while also ensuring that policies are environmentally sustainable. Uh, finally, if you're thinking about the, what, what the lagging, lagging regions, you know, the, the divide between East Indonesia and West Indonesia, uh, you think about the challenge of connecting to the, the more dynamic Western regions of Indonesia combined with the global economy, but also building on local potentials, whether it's maritime resources or, or tourism or dry land agriculture. So when you're thinking region, you think international, then you think national, and then you think local, and e each set of issues have a particular set of challenges connected with the, with the local and the, and the national. Truly, yes. Truly, and I invite you to listen to the other speakers who will give us a lot of interesting questions. Um, willingness and also the um, 
wish of the population to express their democratic aspirations. And then finally, I uh, draw a few conclusions. How decentralization has affected and has in fact led to the survival of the Indonesian uh, nation uh, state. So I think it's very important to really look back at 1998, where it all started, in order to appreciate how far Indonesia has come in terms of its decentralization and also in terms of its democratization process. Now, across the world, if you look at literature on decentralization, decentralization programs are launched for a variety of reasons. You know, they are economic reasons, you know, reasons of economic modernization, like in China or Vietnam. They can be part of post authoritarian transitions, like in Brazil or South Africa or Mexico. Uh, they are sometimes also part of post-conflict post healing uh, situations, like in Cambodia, Rwanda, or uh, Uganda. But very few states have, in fact, launched decentralization programs at the height of a severe political crisis, where the existence of the state itself was uh, questioned. Uh, as has uh, Indonesia in 1998. Yeah. Very few states launch decentralization programs in order to prevent the disintegration of the state, and I argue that is what Indonesia did uh, in 1998. As uh, Kadir Basri mentioned uh, this morning, there were concerns both in Indonesia and uh, abroad as well that Indonesia could become the next Yugoslavia or Soviet Union. Uh, and so decentralization was, in fact, designed as a policy response to the uh, threat. That was done despite the knowledge among policymakers at the time. I mean, nobody among the people who launched decentralization were naive about its possible negative impacts. Uh, the literature was just too clear on that. And I here just I mean, five uh, conventional wisdoms uh, about decentralization uh, that you can find across the literature. Number one, uh, the impact is uh, mixed at best in terms of realizing many of the stated objectives of reform. Hell has just uh, referred to that, that in fact uh, the quality of public services uh, probably hasn't improved all that much. Secondly, there is increasing regional inequality, as Proudhon has shown. Thirdly, there is wasteful spending benefiting the elite rather than the poor. Moro has written about that. And then local democracy in power is the already powerful. Uh, I have written about that as well. And then there's Pati uh, and then Hell as well, as I uh, already mentioned. You have a decentralization of corruption. Now, this is what the literature has said all along about decentralization can happen. Uh, and I would argue, and many authors have demonstrated that, that all of that, all of that has happened in Indonesia. My point, however, is that that should not be uh, the surprise, given what the literature told us uh, is likely to happen. My argument is that despite all of this, the more surprising thing to learn about Indonesian uh, then democratization is in fact how well it has worked in terms of uh, operationalizing and stabilizing center-periphery uh, relations. Arguably, these relations are more stable today than ever before, and that includes also the 1950s and early 1960s. So what accounts for this apparent paradox? So on the one hand, you have all of the negative impacts of decentralization, effectiveness, corruption, and all the rest. But at the same time, center-periphery relations are stable. Now, Ed Espinel has advanced this argument that the least interests have been effectively accommodated by decentralization, and therefore, uh, the relationship with is stable. This is uh, a very important and very valid point, but in my chapter I add four additional factors to what I believe are the most important reasons uh, for the stability of center peripheral relations. Number one, strong public satisfaction with decentralization, the flourishing of local identities, increased level of state penetration, and also careful intellectual uh, engineering. So, uh, first, and again, I can't go into any uh, details here, but if you look at these numbers, uh, they're very clear. This is a poll done by LSD in the Vagas of Indonesia several years ago, where people were simply asked, without any specifics, uh, whether they support or reject uh, local autonomy. You see 73% of Indonesians support it, 27% uh, uh, reject it. 
You also have uh, figures like this that show the net satisfaction of political administrations and institutions across uh, Indonesia. And you see, in fact, that you know, there's a correlation between uh, the level uh, of uh, administration and public <coughs> satisfaction. The closer people are to government, uh, the more local in that sense government is, the more satisfied Indonesians are. And that shows, of course, uh, that you know, they are increasingly satisfied with the main actors in decentralization, uh, and that's uh, the district level, and in fact, if they go down to sub-district and village level, um, uh, the satisfaction is even, even higher. Again, I can't go in, into uh, more details, but the chapter has a little bit more of a specific discussion about that relationship between public satisfaction uh, and the stability of center uh, periphery relations. Another factor I think that's important in explaining that satisfaction is the renaissance of local identities, and once again, we need to appreciate uh, the situation where Indonesia was coming from uh, at the time in order to understand how far it has come. Um, under the new order at the time, there were laws number 5, 1974, and number 5, 1979 that standardized local government. Uh, local government under the new order was completely standardized according to one blueprint of local government drafted up in uh, part of Japanese and Sudanese officials ruled a very large number of districts and provinces. In fact, you know, 73 percent of all, all provinces were run by Japanese or Sudanese bureaucrats for at least one term, uh, 50 percent of those provinces for at least uh, 10 years. So that's where uh, uh, Indonesia stood in 1998. Heavy uh, concentration of Javanese and Sundanese officials in the framework of a uh, standardized local government uh, legislation. What has happened uh, after 1998? You see uh, that the map, the political map of Indonesia, has fundamentally changed. Um, political affiliations and loyalties are now all over the place, and these are just the actual. Uh, maps uh, from the 99, 2004, and 99 elections. So you, you you see that you know it's no longer predictable like it was under the new order. You know who would rule a particular province, who would rule a particular district. Uh, now it changes from election uh, to election. Also, this uh, dominance of Javanese and Sundanese officials in the Alpha Islands has completely disappeared by 2013. Only one Javanese governor rules outside of Java. Citizens can elect personnel for 11 political institutions uh, in up to seven different polls during the life of the cycle. You know, that, of course, now leads to a certain electoral apathy uh, across Indonesia. But Indonesians do have now, in stark contrast to the past, uh, strong opportunities uh, to express their local activities that were previously uh, suppressed under the new order. Now, a lot of people, of course, say, well, that's all fine about the reemergence of local identities, but that has also led to local chauvinism and violence and all the rest. There's some truth to it, but if you look at the statistics, it's actually not coming out. Here you see uh, statistics about communal violence in Indonesia, and you see that it may have, in fact, spiked. Uh, in uh, 1999, so just before uh, decentralization was launched, and it then decreased with the implementation of decentralization. And by 2003, we were almost back to normal levels in terms of fatalities, in terms of the cases of communal violence, uh, and it is uh, at a very low level uh, today. So the argument that local identities, the reemergence of local identities, has created new opportunities for violence uh, does not uh, come out in these kinds of statistics. Another argument that you, know, you often hear about decentralization is that it undermines the role, the strength, the power of the central state. You know, that the state loses its influence, loses its authority to a variety of local uh, governments and that therefore the role of the state as such uh, declines. Now that has not happened in Indonesia. In fact, we have seen an expansion of the state, the, an expansion of the various branches of the state into 
areas of Indonesia where previously there was no representation of civilian uh, government. So this whole fear that decentralization would create a vacuum of power has not uh, occurred. And quite ironically, in fact, um, the process that was responsible for that was the much maligned uh, Pemakawa, because Pemakawa has brought civilian governments uh, into areas that were previously only dominated by uh, the military. Here you see the statistics in that, so Pemakawa has not only taken uh, place at the district level, but in fact, more importantly, at the sub-district and the village level. Uh, the, the figure that the finance minister used this morning was in fact an old one. He said 73,000 villages were now close to to, to 80,000. So the state and its representation is expanding rapidly into uh, the areas. And one side effect of that has also been that uh, the state has been civilianized. Uh, previously, uh, there was this view that uh, in remote areas, it's only Babinsa, it's only the military that can maintain the representation of the state. That is no longer so. The decentralization has pushed uh, civilian state institutions into um, the uh, forest uh, corners of the archipelago. Last point I want to make is about local elections. Um, it's very clear that the Indonesians enjoy the opportunity, as Hal has also mentioned, to throw out poorly performing uh, incumbents and bring in um, new candidates, fresh faces they believe are more capable of bringing in uh, the governance, Jacobi, of course, is uh, one example <coughs> of all this. And you can see that once um, the central government tried to at least launch the idea of abolishing uh, local elections, you know, the response from the population was clear. Here's a poll from 2010 66% of the Indonesian uh, population supports the continuation of the current electoral regime. Indonesians want to be able to elect their government, they want to be able to elect their district heads and reject any attempt by the central government to uh, abolish uh, those uh, electoral mechanisms. So overall, again, uh, Indonesia's decentralization process has witnessed a lot of problems, but again, this is, I believe, not very surprising. More surprising is uh, that given Indonesia's political history and level of economic development, uh, that that process has actually worked. You know, the last time Indonesia uh, launched a major decentralization program, and that was in the late uh, 1950s, 1956, what followed after that, we all know there were regional rebellions, there was the collapse of democracy, and 40 years of military backed authoritarianism. So, given that history, that legacy, the current uh, decentralization uh, process has work very, very well. Also, if we look at uh, other examples, if you look at Sudan, if you look at Nigeria, Burma, Ukraine, and even Belgium, all of these countries that are currently struggling with local autonomy issues, uh, I would say uh, Indonesia has done what it could in order to stabilize center uh, <coughs> periphery. Places. Thank you very much. on two of the questions that Hal uh, raised earlier in his talk. So firstly, have poorer regions been protected from uh, the reforms? 
Uh, and secondly, what's the relative importance of decentralization and some of the socioeconomic outcomes, in our case, we're interested in poverty, relative to other factors such as the commodity uh, boom. Okay, so obviously there's been a, a, a lot of change over the last uh, 20 years. <coughs> Um, since 1973 to 97, there's been very sharp declines <coughs> in poverty, however you measure it, and despite all the debates about the measurement, clearly poverty has declined very significantly during this period. And obviously, uh, there was the, the financial crisis uh, in 97, 98, and Indonesia was the, the most badly affected country. A period of recovery, uh, which also included uh, reformation, democratization, and decentralization. And coming out of this were predictions of what would happen uh, in the following decades. Uh, to one, uh, and this is a lot of the, the textbook theory that Bell was discussing, fairer resource allocation, uh, local decision making, faster poverty reduction, but also Kumakara, or the splitting of districts. We've now had uh, just over a decade of recovery, economic stability, but also this commodity driven resource boom beginning in about 2002. And so now is about the first time in which we can really stop and say, well, what's happened in terms of regional poverty dynamics in the last decade? Uh, as as Hal has said elsewhere, development dynamics are a long-term phenomenon and involving decades rather than years. So now it's still perhaps too early, but the first point in which we can reasonably say uh, what we see so far. So I won't dwell on uh, the financial crisis and, and reformasi. Uh, Marcus and Hal have both discussed that, other than to point out two things quickly. So firstly, uh, not only did, uh, was there sort of significant economic uh, um, contraction, uh, poverty increased by, the poverty rate increased by a third, and the number of poor increased by nearly 50%. So when you're talking about what's going on about patterns of poverty in Indonesia before and after the Reformation, you can't get away from the very significant impact that the crisis had. And the second thing is just to point out you know, this faster poverty reduction being one of the predictions or at least the arguments for decentralization. So to what extent do we see this coming through in the patterns of poverty uh, afterwards? Uh, on the other hand, uh, as Marcus and Hannah both said, implementation of this decentralization wasn't necessarily textbook either. So this prediction may have not come to pass. So before we look at uh, the work we have in our book, I'll just summarize very quickly you know, what do we know already about uh, poverty in Indonesia. So uh, Dano and colleagues uh, have done some work which look at um, the relationship between growth and poverty reduction uh, before Chris Modern Reformasi and afterwards. And actually they've found, contrary to a lot of popular belief, the speed of poverty reduction relative to growth has stayed relatively constant. So, um, relative to the amount of growth, the rate at which poverty has fallen before and after uh, the, the Reformation, um, it's, it's been pretty similar. The second thing that we know, if we're talking now about the patterns of, of economic growth and poverty reduction since decentralization, is that economic growth has not been shared equally. And so we know, and, and we discussed this morning, that uh, inequality is rising in, in Indonesia, you know, one of the reasons for this is this, this unequal sharing of growth. So if we look at how fast did real household consumption grow um, in, say, the last decade, for the poorest of 40% of Indonesians, it was 2% or less per annum. So pretty slowly relative to economic growth, but also slowly relative to that of the richest 10%, where it grew at over 6% uh, per year. The other thing we're saying, uh, that we're seeing is, is the rate of poverty reduction may have stayed relatively stable this decade compared to the decade before, but in recent years it's been slowing. So in 2012 and 2013, the rate of poverty reduction uh, was the slowest we've seen in a decade, 0.5 percentage points uh, each year. And that's the slowest except for the, the global food price shock of, of 2006. The other thing is, going forward, the prospects of the future suggest that <coughs> this may, may be a new, a new normal in the sense that the remaining poor are increasingly farther and farther below the poverty line. So it's really getting harder and harder to reach them. And that's something that I'm going to return to at the end of the discussion. Uh, and then finally, what did we know about patterns of regional poverty uh, before Reformasi? 
uh, some earlier work by, by Mira shows that um, it was provincial poverty convergence. So that is to say, provinces that were poorer in 1984 saw greater rates of poverty reduction relative to those who had lower poverty rates. So poorer um, provinces made better strides in poverty reduction than in uh, less poor ones. And one of the key questions we're looking to answer is, did this pattern continue after reformation? So let's have a look at that. In the, in the chapter, we look at both provincial and district level patterns. In the interest of time, we can keep this to the, largely to the provincial level. One of the first things to note is that uh, after decentralization, the revenue per capita of small provinces relative to the national average actually improved. So what we have here is if we look at um, the revenue per capita at a provincial level as a ratio of the national average, on the uh, horizontal axis we have 1996. So one means you're at the national average. You have about the same revenue per capita uh, as the national average. If you have less than one, it was lower. and greater than one, you had more. Um, on the vertical axis, we have 2009, so that's where it is now. That green line is the 45 degree line. The way to think about this is if you're above this green line as a province, then you've increased your revenues per capita relative to the national average. For there to be so many provinces above the line and so few below the line, that means the ones below the line must be much larger in terms of population, and that's what we're seeing. So the, the provinces which are basically on or below the line are the larger provinces of Java, but also Jakarta. So it looks like, actually, from a provincial perspective, revenues are arguably being, being shared in a, in a more fashion. But what about the patterns of po poverty pre- and uh, post Christmas and Reformasi? So what we have here is, on the horizontal axis, at the bottom, the annual change in poverty in percentage point terms uh, before uh, the crisis. And we've, we've, we've gone from 1993 here for, for data issues in terms of comparability. And then we look at how many, what's the annual change in poverty in the decade after reformation and decentralization was implemented. Um, and so what you see here is actually a lot of change. In the upper right corner, only North Sulawesi, only one province has a constantly worse position. I, it was worse than the national average, which is the vertical and <coughs> lines, uh, before and it's worse afterwards. You see a small number of provinces which were both better, had better rates of poverty reduction before, and better rates of poverty reduction subsequently, including notably Maluku and Papua in Eastern Indonesia. But for the majority of uh, provinces, it's a, position, it's a situation of change. So in the bottom right-hand corner, these were provinces which had slower than average poverty reduction before, but are now seeing faster than average. But there are also those uh, for whom the situation has changed uh, adversely, uh, notably Jakarta and Bali here, uh, where you see faster than average reduction before, uh, reformasi and slower subsequently. Um, so what about convergence? Well, convergence has pretty clearly continued after, Refor um, after Reformasi. So uh, on, on the bottom here, we have the initial poverty rate in 2003, the percentage point terms, and on the, uh, horizontal, on the vertical axis, we have the annual change in percentage points in the last decade of the poverty rate. And so clearly, those who had um, higher initial poverty rates in 2003 have seen greater reductions uh, in, in poverty in the subsequent decade, uh, and those who have had lower rates have seen slower. So here we have the convergence, Papua Maluku, uh, Aceh, uh, Nusa Tenggara, have all seen um, faster than the average changes, and you also see convergence in the top left, where those like Jakarta and Bali, which had lower initial rates, are seeing slower poverty as well. So this is the first question which I was asking, <coughs> Poorer regions being protected from the reforms, well, you do see this pattern of convergence continue uh, that we had seen before reformation. Uh, even though we've seen changes in the relationship of local revenues per capita, its relationship to, to poverty reduction was weak before reformation. So if you look at the change in poverty relative to your your per capita revenues, it's a pretty weak relationship there, and that pattern hasn't really changed um, after reformation either. 
Uh, another weak uh, relationship you see is between GRDP per capita, uh, gross regional domestic product, uh, and poverty. So beforehand, a very weak relationship between uh, your economic growth on the vertical axis and your poverty reduction on the horizontal, and this weak relationship uh, continued after FMRC. So what does all of this mean? We see continued convergence, but we see a number of changes in terms of the, the other poverty patterns. What does this mean to relative poverty rankings uh, between the provinces? Well, they're largely unchanged. So, uh, what we have uh, on, on the bottom here is the 1996 relative position. Again, one means you're at the national average in terms of your poverty rate. Less than one, you're less poor. More than one, you're more poor. And then we plot that against where your your poverty is relative. Your provincial poverty is relative to the national level now, and you can see a pretty strong uh, downward uh, relationship uh, with most provinces. Uh, either being in the upper right hand corner, which is to say they were worse than average before Reformasi and they're still worse than average. Uh, again, those would be Eastern Indonesia. Or you're in the bottom left hand corner, which is to say you're in a better position before Reformasi and, and that uh, position holds today. Only one province which has sort of significantly improved is the West of Kalimantan, uh, and only one that sort of significantly changed its ranking, which is, you know, for obvious reasons, our change. Uh, moreover, this recent slowing pace of poverty reduction may, may well uh, be set to continue in the, into the future. So this is one thing I, I sort of wanted to, to highlight. Um, here we're looking again, we're seeing uh, this convergence. You've got this initial poverty rate now, I've, I've used 2010, and then we've got the annual reduction in poverty on the vertical axis, and you can quite clearly see that uh, the higher your initial poverty, the greater your poverty re rate of poverty reduction. But I'd also like to highlight the 10% line. So the national poverty right now, 11.5%, roughly speaking 10%. If you look at provinces who had an initial poverty rate of 10% in 2010, none of them saw much poverty reduction in the next three years. It's either zero or nor, near zero uh, falls uh, in poverty. So if we're thinking about what's going to happen with poverty in Indonesia going forward on current trends, uh, there's not a lot of optimism to think that the slowing rate of poverty reduction isn't a new normal. So in terms of uh, the conclusions from, from at the provincial level, convergence does continue. So it certainly hasn't been the case that the poorer regions uh, have um, uh, suddenly uh, had worse poverty uh, performance than they've seen uh, beforehand. Nonetheless, the, the poverty rankings remain largely unchanged. It's kind of business as usual in a sense. And as I just said, you know, the prospects for further poverty reduction um, are, are more limited. Uh, you, you will see further poverty reduction in the poor provinces uh, with this convergence happening, but there's probably limited reductions in other locations, which is highlighting the need for new approaches to addressing extreme poverty. What we've done in the past isn't going to work necessarily to reach the remaining poor, and the need for more equal sharing of growth, in that as uh, even current levels of economic growth are going to have less of an effect on poverty as we get into the extreme tail, there will be a need for, for the tail to benefit more from the growth. The final thing I'd like to end on is perhaps a slightly more optimistic note, just to show one of the results from the district level um, analysis we did. And one of the questions we looked at was, does Pamakara have an effect on district level outcomes? Uh, and what we did is we did district level regressions, which included a number of controls. Your initial poverty rate for convergence, uh, we looked at your economic growth, but we also looked at uh, local government revenues and composition of local government spending, uh, amongst other things. And uh, one of the things that we found, uh, and, and more work needs to be done on this, is that actually districts that had split saw great faster rates of poverty reduction even after we controlled for these other aspects. So there was a 10% faster poverty reduction in splitting districts than there was in non-splitting districts. Now, more what needs to be seen to see how robust this result is, but if it is, the key question is what might be the underlying mechanisms? And is there, a, is there an opportunity in the future from decentralization <coughs> as it gets added in and as governments may improve to use this to help address these issues of slowing poverty reduction uh, that I've highlighted. Thank you.
Good afternoon, uh, almost um, everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and um, speak today. Um, uh, I will be talking today about um, the forest, governing the forest and forest land. Yeah. That is very clear. 
Um, a lot of lands that have been, uh, uh, that people have lived in for so many years are also Kawasan Hutan. So it becomes state land because of this uh, uh, policy statement consensus. They did happen. Um, now it also has very uh, much implications on uh, spatial planning because the spatial planning has to coincide uh, with the uh, Haka or the Tegi Haka has to, uh, this has to be a uh, did um, reconcile that between the Tegi Haka and the uh, spatial planning. Mm. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a uh, pressure here. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so of the Kawasan Bhutan, uh, a lot of these were designated, only six designated. So this is designation of Kawasan Bhutan, but only 16% uh, at the moment has been decided. So Tata Batas, which one is Kawasan Bhutan, which one is not Kawasan Bhutan, and uh, is, is, is very blurred, where only 16% uh, is already decided. So that is the biggest, the biggest issue at the moment. Now, that has implications on the spatial planning. The spatial planning, tata, uh, tata ruang, ya, tata ruang wilayah provinsi, tata ruang wilayah kabupaten, is actually the guide to, to, to have any development uh, in the regions. Now, we have the spatial planning law, and according to that law, all provinces are supposed to complete uh, the spatial plans uh, with PERDA, uh, PERDA, uh, PERDA uh, by 2009. But the issue is that there's all, it's very difficult to reconcile the Patamatas Kutan, the Kawasan Kutan, with the spatial plan. So the process of spatial planning, the guideline, the reference on which local land and regional development is to be done, uh, is, has the, the, is very slow process. So um, for instance, at the moment, like Rio doesn't have a special plan. Santa Kalimantan also does a kind of special plan. Um, now the forest estate, because it was made, you know, in like, um, it was basically a dust exercise, a lot of the reality on the ground is not reflected in the Dehaka, in the maps. Um, a lot of several uh, stakeholders have challenged uh, to the institutional court, where they, they want to make sure that the, um, all of the the, 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 estate, yeah, the estate has to be uh, properly uh, designated and stipulated. Um, another, another issue that uh, has been, um, has had significant implications in terms of land use and uh, forest allocation and animation is the use of different and various maps. So local governments use their own maps Ministry of Forestry use their own maps, uh, sectoral, there are also sectoral maps by the Agriculture Ministry and even uh, also uh, the mining uh, sector and uh, also the home affairs. Yeah? So um, the active status and tenure of land uh, led to business uncertainty and a lot of conflicts um, in Indonesia. This is, for instance, has been uh, uh, very obvious in the implementation of the MPTGA AE. Yeah, uh, the special planning uh, at the end of last year, for instance, only 17 of the 33 provinces have had their special plans uh, endorsed. Um, now I think that there has been two more, but it's still uh, only a little more than half of the, all the total provinces. You can imagine any development without any reference, yeah? any reference to guidelines on how to develop the, how to develop the this. Um, Okay, so after after the after the maps, after the special plan, special plans that are used, they are supposed to be used as a reference, as a guide to develop and you know, use uh, and use uh, land activities, the forest land use activities. Uh, we see that the development in the regions um, with, with respect to natural resources is, um, uh, used to be timber concessions, and now uh, the government is uh, uh, promoting timber plantations, but to Two sectors have been growing very rapidly, that's agricultural establishment and also the mining sector. Um, what are the issues here? The issues are, again, uh, as, as Hal uh, already alluded to, is really, uh, has to do a lot to do with income, yeah? income generation. Uh, uh, mining, uh, mining and agricultural licensing are a great source of income for local 
what has happened is that a lot, because of these different maps, because of a lot of the interpretation of the um, spatial planning maps, which are not even done, which is in progress, there's a lot of interpretation of the Tata Guna Hotel uh, Forest Estate, um, different interpretations among local governments, uh, also the different sectors from the national government. Um, a lot of these licenses have overlapped with each other. So there's oil palm, for instance, oil licenses in a Kupang Hindu, in a protected forest. There's also the mining license, also in that particular area, and so on. So it's really an uncertainty for businesses, for any development, and also uh, a rise of large conflict. Um, so these are just a, a little uh, sub portraits, so just to give you an idea of what's really happening. This is an East Kalimantan in Laurel where timber, uh, or some forests are still good because it's not so big logs, yeah, large logs. This is an acacia plantation in East Kalimantan, also uh, in the Laurel area. Uh, this is oil palm, the green gold. So the forests, uh, the summer forests, a lot of these forests have changed and become this. Uh, this is in Central Kalimantan. Uh, these are the oil palm. Branches in West Kalimantan. Now, as you can see, uh, nationally, the trend of oil pump activities are always uh, going up. Uh, uh, be it in the, um, be it in, in terms of area, in terms of production, in terms of export, and also in terms of bank credits. Yeah? So everything, uh, everything is supporting uh, this. Um, these are some pictures from uh, Billy Duwagi and some other influential in Southeast Sulawesi. You can see here a little bit of water here, you know, a little bit of wall space here. But then it becomes this progressive encroachment in Southeast Sulawesi. Uh, mining and forest, uh, there's over 5 million uh, hectares of forest uh, estate uh, has been released to mining. So this is the one of the biggest pressures of forest as well. Uh, here's coal mining, which is coal mining in East Kalimantan. This is all about development land development in East Kalimantan. Uh, the, trend, the national trend of mining, for instance, coal is also kind of similar to the white palm um, expansion. It goes up and up and up. Uh, I believe that it's steadily going down now, but you know, with, with a, a new, for instance, new Bupati, you know, we will see, we will find out if more Indian Usana Patambangan going to be an issue again. <coughs> this is nickel mining in South Sulawesi, just to give you a flavor. So these are some of the activities in the regions that are um, very important for the development of the regions, very important for the livelihood of the communities living in the region. So this is what has become. Uh, this will be a very rich land forest, and this is now what has become. It's very difficult to return. It to reverse it you know, to the original condition. This is, uh, if you go to some, in some areas of Kalimantan, this is Sejau Mata Pemandang, yeah? we, we see this uh, instead of very lush forest. Okay, so this is the issue, uh, this is a map of um, overlapping, overlapping concessions, overlapping izin usaha pertambangan, uh, izin usaha pertambangan dengan izin usaha perkebunan. And some of these are located in uh, protected forests. Okay, and this is uh, also uh, in uh, overlapping of licenses, also in forested areas in East Kalimantan. Uh, now, uh, several years ago, uh, since 2011, 2010, 2011, uh, we have, uh, the president actually, have um, um, issued a moratorium, yeah, in the moratorium on, on the conversion of uh, some forests, primary forests, and very more key lands. And however, uh, there's still uh, uh, mining and oil pump on these uh, forests that have specifically are not supposed to be converted. So you see the difficulties in the governance, the actual governance uh, on, the, uh, on the ground. Okay, so uh, what to do? What to do? Well, in, uh, internationally and also nationally, there are talks about a win-win solution. What to do? Yeah, there's a there's a need for livelihood, there's a need for income generation, there's a need for development in the regions, but also there's a need for conservation, for long-term sustainability uh, in the regions. Um, there's an initiative now. It's called uh, RBDD, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation. 
for those of you who are familiar with that, it is basically an initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that are contributing to climate change by uh, reducing the deforestation and degradation and verified reduction of emissions uh, will get compensated, be it at the national level, jurisdictional level, or the project level. Um, so some people think that this could uh, be a win-win uh, solution. However, REP is very slow in putting in Indonesia. There's also an, uh, certainly a land the state, the status of land and tenure, so that's a very big issue because in any development, any businesses, any initiative, you have to have some certainty in the status of the land. Whose is it? Who has right to it? Who has control to it? Who has control to manage it? Okay. So, um, and also, uh, there are clearly very uh, short-term interests in terms of the local, uh, from the local government's uh, point when we deal, uh, it's true that um, uh, there, there has to be balance between conservation and development, both are necessary. Uh, and red is certainly more likely to work than compatible with in 